I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and this week we are in the kitchen at Story Restaurant in the Prairie Village Shops with their co-owner and executive chef, Carl Thorne Thompson. Carl, thank you for inviting me into your kitchen. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay, Story is the name of the restaurant. I just, why is it named Story? Uh, it's named Story for a number of reasons. One okay. was that uh, a long time ago I was an English major and uh, I wanted to be a writer, that's mm -hmm. part of it. The other part of it is that as a, as a cook, I am uh, inspired by ingredients. And when you search out great ingredients and you get to know where your ingredients come from, you realize there's a story behind it. Very nice. Okay, so let's talk about your story. Did you start out when you, you mentioned an English major, did you start out wanting to be a chef? No, I no. Had no, I had no idea. No idea. No idea until I was maybe 30 years old. Uh, mm. And uh, I think it started, I wanted to be a writer. I wrote, I wrote fiction and uh, sent my little short stories off to magazines and things like that. And, uh, but I'll tell you one of the common threads with our chefs, and that is that cooking, it, as we know, is a creative expression. And so many of our chefs have other creative expressions. You're my first writer, so a distinction. So you were going to be a writer of fiction, and you did that for a while. For a number of years, 10 years, 12 years. Oh, good yeah. for you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So from being a writer of fiction to the rest, how did you, how did you get into the kitchen? And that is never, that's not really clear to me. I just know that I became, uh, I wanted to make a really good chocolate cake. And, uh, That's a good reason, Chef. And uh, yes. that was it. After that, and it just kind of grew from there. I, I went from chocolate cake to uh, beef stew to uh, I, I don't know what. I mean, I basically just threw myself into it. And um, okay, so started out because you wanted to make a really yeah. good chocolate cake, and then once you accomplished that, you went to other things. Where did you first begin cooking professionally? My first job was in Wichita, Kansas, okay. in a, a, a store called With a Twist. It was, With a Twist. With a Twist. Uh, it was a it was a, a gourmet food store. Uh -huh. We also had an espresso bar, mm -hmm. and uh, we served lunches and did some catering. Mm -hmm. So uh, I made a lot of sandwiches. I made a lot of desserts, okay. uh, yep, pies yep. and cakes and muffins and bagels and bread. And so you make bread too. Yes. Yeah, oh. we made bread there, and I continue to make bread, make bread here. Nice. All right. So because if you're having espresso or coffee, you need a little something to go with it. So you began cooking there in this really nice upscale specialty food store. Right. Okay. So you were there for a while. How did you get from Wichita to Kansas City? Well, while I worked there, I. Um developed a relationship with the owner. And, oh, uh, anyone we, we know? We, <laughs> we got, got married. married. Okay. And she, had, she had family in Kansas City. Uh, mm -hmm. After a certain time, we decided that, you know, you know Wichita is great a great town as it is. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not really developed uh, culinarily, or it wasn't back then, yes. about eight years ago, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. So we just moved up here. Uh, Susan's family was up here. And uh, there was more of a thriving culinary scene in Kansas City and a community for your children yeah. as well. Yeah. All right, so you came to Kansas City because you were serious about pursuing a culinary career, and where did you begin cooking here? I worked at 40 Sardines. Ah, under James Beard Award-winning chefs. So we're talking about serious training here. How long were you at 40 Sardines? Uh, I was there three years, mm -hmm. three and a half years. Uh, I worked, uh, I, I, it was basically where I learned how to cook in a professional environment. What I had done in Wichita was sort of my own creation. It yes. was a little kitchen with one stove and one oven, and I kind of made my own rules, and I didn't know exactly what I was doing. I, I helped Michael Smith uh, in uh, 2007 when he opened the Michael Smith restaurant down the crossroads. I helped him open that. So you had the opportunity because cooking and rent, running a restaurant are two different skill sets. Yeah. So <laughs> you're laughing because it's so fresh in your mind yeah, right now. But you you were part of the effort and the work that went into opening up Michael Smith's. So you were learning, you were still in training in that aspect as well. And then how long were you with Michael? Uh, for three years as well, and I helped him open Extra Virgin. Uh, and, but you're right, the, the opening 
I mean, Michael opened those restaurants. I opened the kitchens in those restaurants, and there's a big difference. I mean, I was just focused entirely on the food and staff in the kitchen, and uh, and I came to learn opening story that uh, you know when you're when you're focusing on the entire restaurant, there's just much more involved. So. Much more, and let's talk about the environment here. This is exquisite space. Thank you. So, what was the creative process for? just the space alone here at Story. I wanted it to be contemporary, but mm -hmm. not, but not uh, alienating. I wanted, I wanted to be comfortable, uh, but I'm not, a, I'm not a cluttered person. I like things neat, streamlined. Um, if it, it needs to sort of have a purpose, I suppose. You know, if it doesn't have a purpose, I don't know that I want it here. Kind of. Okay, so what is the concept for Story? What kind of food are we going to find here? We do contemporary American, but contemporary American that comes from from Europe as opposed to uh, Asian influence. Because of that. My influences are Italy, and, Italy, France, and Spain. Primarily. Great influences. And, uh, yeah. We'll also take great care with selecting the food product. I mean, you came from a background of a specialty food store, so right then and there, we cared about the quality of what we're working with. Are you working with local growers? How do you go about getting the food product before it ever gets into the kitchen? Uh, I do work locally uh, mm -hmm. with local people, uh, mostly in the summer, spring, sure. summer, and fall months. Mm -hmm. In the winter, there's less less uh, available. Mm -hmm. uh, Overland, Overland Park Farmers Market. I go there twice a week. Uh, you know, I have a guy who uh, delivers me pears, uh, peaches all summer, uh, tomatoes. You know. So it's amazing when we talk to our chefs, so many of them that have been trained in Europe did exactly what you're doing, and that is they went to the market. So the menu was driven by what was fresh and abundant and seasonal at the market. So are we going to find seasonal foods here? Yeah, we are seasonal, but we're also, and we're, we use local as much as possible, but sure. I don't like to sort of exclude the rest of the world, the rest of the, I mean, we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have halibut or salmon on our menu and things of like that. So for me, it's a mixture of uh, using local stuff to maybe enhance uh, a beautiful piece of fish from mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. or from the North Atlantic or something mm -hmm. like that. So you're in the kitchen. And I always ask chefs this question. It's hot. You're on your feet for hours. You're lifting heavy things. How do you stay inspired? It's hard work. Yeah, for me, it's you know, it's ingredients and it's and it's customer satisfaction. That's I suppose. Okay. I mean, we had last 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 week had some beautiful um, flounder. It was I mean, mm. it was just fresh. Out. It was it was beautiful. It was mm. almost in, in rigor mortis. So it was so fresh. Uh, things like that and. Uh, you know, I come on, I talk to the customers uh, now and then, and, for you. and uh, just to sort of see that we're all on the same page, I suppose, <laughs> or, you know. The, the well, you know, and, and I tell this to our viewers all the time, if you've had something that you <clears> just <throat> love, make sure the server gets that information back to the chef, because how else do you know? Uh, and the reverse is true, should you have something that just didn't quite work for you, Tell the chef, you have no way of knowing that if you don't hear it back from your customers. So the ingredients inspire you and just the wish to please. You, you want your customers to say, oh, that is the best, or I so enjoy whatever it is. And I like, I like that. I mean, I like the heat in the kitchen. I like, <laughs> I like the, you know, I like the, the energy that comes about wow. with the deadlines, you know, five o'clock is service time. And, I mean, it makes makes the time pass. It makes it just it just gives you a sort of a sense of purpose, I suppose. I okay, so the the energy yeah, that like that. that happens, the energy synergy with your cooks, and that brings right. out another another question. As executive chef, you provide the leadership in the kitchen. And what is it that you are wanting to impart to your to your cooks? Yeah, I just, I'm, they, they just need to. Uh, do things as well as they can. Do yes. it. I mean, every dish has to be, you know, the best that they can make it be. Okay. You know? And they, they need to, they need to understand technique. You know, they need to understand how to sear a piece of fish or, mm -hmm. or cook a steak medium rare. Mm -hmm. uh, how to finish a sauce with a little bit of lemon juice to brighten mm -hmm. the flavors. Mm -hmm. 
basically, I mean, we try to teach them that. You know, we try to teach them how to taste things, how seasoning. Mm -hmm. You know, but basically, they have to want to do it. And they have to want to be good at it. Okay, so the desire in them, which is what gets them in your kitchen to mm -hmm. begin with, and then I assume they're always learning from watching you and from do and from doing it. But you, obviously, you have a standard of. This has to be really excellent. It has to be the best possible sauce that you can make. And so we, that's what we try to impress upon them: is that you know, shoot, for, shoot for the stars. Just make, you know, make it. Try to make it incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's an everyday thing: make it incredible. Yeah. Okay. All right, chef. What are we going to make in the kitchen today for your signature dish? Uh, we're going to do uh, a lamb dish. We call it a lamb crepinette. Is that a little crepe? No, it's nope. not a crepe. It's um, it's a crepinette is, is is more like a sausage. All right. So what else are we going to serve with this? We're serving a falafel mm -hmm. with, that's been flavored with um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's flavored with black olives, Kalamata olives. Mm -hmm. uh, we serve artichokes, uh, zucchini, and what I call a roasted mole, which is uh, basically a, a vegetable, a spicy vegetable puree. Okay. So we're going to have all that on the plate. Mm -hmm. I think you and I should go back into the kitchen and do this. And I think you should come with us. Okay, we are in the kitchen at Stroy Restaurant with their owner and chef, Carl Thorne Thompson. We are going to make a signature dish that has lamb in it. And you take it right almost from the lamb itself. So what do we have here? Uh, lamb legs, a domestic, bone-in, uh, free-range, organic lamb leg. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so the, the lamb comes in like this, and then what do you do then from we, this? Then we break it down. We, we separate the bones, so the bones. Uh, this is the shank. If you ever mm -hmm. go to a restaurant, you get a lamb shank. This yes. are the steaks mm. we cut out of it. I'm going to get a piece of the lamb steak, I'm going to call it. Or yes, it's a little filet or whatever. I'm going to season it. Uh -huh. What are you, and that's just, kosher salt? It's kosher salt. Okay. And um, I'm going to let just a little pepper on it while my mm -hmm. hands are... Uh, I can, I can do that. Okay, over the whole thing? Over the whole thing. That's it, one more, we're good. Okay, we've got pepper, we've got salt. This. Okay. What you're trying to do is just to compact a it a little bit, yes. That's it. And there's our little guy. Now where is he going to go from here? He goes into a, another bag. All right. And this is a special bag that is designed to take a little designed bit of heat. For sous vide, yes. For sous vide. And I guess when you purchase your sous vide, equipment you can also get these yeah. bags. Alright, so he's all wrapped up, he's in his little sous vide bag and now we have to seal him. So this is called the vacuum sealer. Yes. I'm just gonna put him like this across the heating element right there. So he's close the lid. Magic. He's gonna suck all the air out and put a tight seal on it. And after that we can drop it into a 137 degree water bath where we cook it for one hour. Okay. We're done. And it's gonna pop up. It'll tell us when it's done. Oh! Okay, there's sealed. our little guy. All right, and this would go in the refrigerator if you're not going to see me. So we ground the lamb and put some seasoning in it and wrapped it around a little lamb steak. You made a great looking little sausage guy. The little sausage guy has been vacuum sealed and now he's ready for his bath. This is a sous vide. Tell me what that is. It is, it is just that. It's a water bath. You can, you can uh, keep a very accurate temperature to something, so you can cook a very uniform um, degree of doneness throughout the meal. So we cook this at 137 degrees okay. for one hour. Okay. And then at that point, could you store it in the refrigerator until you needed to prepare yes. the dish? Yes. It's, we try not to do it too far in advance, maybe okay. 24, 24 to 48 hours in advance. Um, and then you're cooking it. And then we'll cook it, yes. we'll cook it again. We'll cook it for our guests. Okay, all right. So he, while he goes into his bath, we can start working on the other parts of the meal? Absolutely. Okay. Enjoy your bath. 
Okay, chef, we are now going to cook off the crepinettes and we're gonna make the falafel. So let's take a look at the result of this ground lamb wrapped around the lamb steaks after it had its sous vide bath. What is a particular note here? What I, the reason I do it like this is because of that consistency of the sausage. It makes it, when you cook it at 137 degrees like that, it makes it smooth and yet it all, it all holds together. It's all, it's a, it's a firm package. And it's cooked all the, it's cooked all the it's way cooked through evenly. Yes, it's cooked evenly all the way through, okay. 137 degrees, medium rare. And you're drying it off. Why are you doing that? I dry it off so it doesn't stick to the pan when I saute it. And you it get doesn't a better, spatter, so you get a better sear on it. Get a better sear on it. Okay so not wet. We dried it off and now it's ready to be cooked. I mean, I'm using a non-stick. I'm cheating a little bit for a professional kitchen. Uh, I don't want to. We forgive you. But we do it in non-stick, or sometimes we'll do it in a, in a stainless pan as well. Okay, chef. We've got the lamb crepinette cooking. Now the sides. What do we have? We have an artichoke. Uh, it started out like this. We turned it, quote unquote, which means we just took all the all the all sharp the edges, all the exteriors, right. to get down to. Uh, the heart. heart. Yes. Basically. So we have a heart. It's been cooked. It's been cooked uh, sous vide again. But you so could boil that. You, you can steam boil it. You could boil that. You could clean it out. You can saute it, roast it. It doesn't matter as much. We do it because it's it's convenient for us. Mm -hmm. So we clean the choke. Yeah. This is you know the not the mouth feel. It's that you would want. So please remember to remove the choke. Yeah, you have to. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a thistle. It's a uh, it's full of fructose. So good. <laughs> and then we're just going to cut them into wedges. Okay. Okay, another green, fresh looking vegetable. We're going to cut zucchini into planks. Okay. See the claw, how we chef cuts the food product and not his fingers. Just trim it slightly. Mm -hmm. We 
have been cooking a fabulous signature dish in Story Restaurant with their executive chef and owner, Carl Thorne Thompson. We eat with our eyes first. So, chef, how are we going to plate this creation of yours? First thing, we, we put down the sauce first. Okay, it's, what's uh, that? What I call a roasted mole. It's uh, sort of a in between a mole and a romesco sauce. It's okay. a puree of roasted vegetables and chili peppers. And did you just about blend it down once it is roasted? We, yeah, we uh, blended a little bit of olive oil, some vinegar. And this seasoning. sauce works for a variety of things. Oh, you, can use it on, you can use it on a steak, you can use it on gravy, great on chicken. Okay, and we're gonna use it on the lamb? Yes, we are. Okay, so, plate. I've been practicing that, I want you to know, because I think it's very pretty. Yeah. There we go. Next thing that goes is our lamb. Over here we have the star. Slice it. We're going to cut it in three. Kind of a sushi approach to the lamb. It is. Oh, yum. Salt on okay, again, kosher salt. Kosher salt. Okay. Falafel. So we're doing the Middle East. We're just borrowing all throughout the Mediterranean for this dish. And then the South America as well. And because, South America. Uh, why not? Well, we're, we are a global community now, we and are. it might as well be reflected in our food. what's great about this is it's beautiful but it also feels accessible like you're not going to have any problem getting into this chef that's a work of art i think from here we should go to the bar and i think we should pair this with the wine of your choice and then we've got celebrity taster coming in william wyden from kinsky ballet he's the artistic director and he's going to taste this and sip the wine and tell us what he thinks we have just been in the kitchen at Story Restaurant with our executive chef and owner Carl Thorne Thompson preparing one of his signature dishes, a lamb crepinette, I said it, um, and a falafel with olives and zucchini and artichokes and chef. The flavors are varied delicious but challenging for pairing. What do you suggest to drink with this? Today I suggest a Barolo from Vietti, 2007 vintage. So uh, Barolo is an area in uh, northern Italy. Okay, now why are you suggesting this particular wine with that dish? I think that some of the flavors are similar. There's some black olive notes in here. There's also some dark fruit and also a, a nice acidity. So that's going to stand up to the flavors of your signature dish. Yeah, I hope so. We'll I hope out. so. We're going to find out because we have invited the artistic director of the Kansas City Ballet, William Whitener, in to taste the food and sip the wine. And so let's hear what he has to say. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and we have been in the kitchen here at Story Restaurant in the Prairie Village Shops with our executive chef and owner, Carl Thorne Thompson. We have prepared a signature dish, and we have paired it with a wine. Chef, we have a celebrity taster with us to give us the final word on the dish and the pairing. It is William Whitener. He's the artistic director of the Kansas City Ballet. Mm -hmm with a big hit on your hands, yeah. too. Thank you for taking time to be with us. Chef, what have you prepared for William? Uh, I prepared a lamb crepinette with uh, black olive falafel, mm. uh, sauteed artichokes and zucchini, and uh, roasted mole. And what should we be drinking with this, or what are we drinking? Today you're drinking a 2007 Vietti Barolo. Chef, thank you very much. Thank and thank you. now we're going to test. Okay, William, your Thank task you. <laughs> is to taste and sip. Okay. Okay. And I'm being polite, waiting for you. Oh, you are. Okay. <laughs> I have never seen a um, lamb prepared like this before. Nor I. Nor I, yes. Uh, I mean, literally, he made like a lamb sausage, he took the lamb steak, he wrapped it in this, sous vide it, sauteed it. 
mm. herbs and garlic and Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Unusual. This is a mole. Original. Original. And he sauteed some zucchini, mm. artichokes. I want to dig in. Mm. To this falafel. I'm a falafel fan. Mm, good mole sauce. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. Mm. You could fight over that falafel. I would fight over this falafel. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Okay. Oh, you're I'm, still on the I'm lamb. I'm hooked on the lamb. You're hooked on the okay, lamb. I'll try some falafel. Okay. Mmm. Mmm. Isn't that amazing? It's very light. It is light and flavorful, and sometimes you don't always get both of those at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, falafel is something that I've tried to think when I first had it. it either when I moved to New York mm -hmm. as a young dancer in 1969. Yeah. Or maybe it was in Chicago, because we toured to Chicago in the Joffrey Ballet. That was my first job in New York. Good for you. And that's, wonderful that's when I was introduced to exotic foods that I hadn't had in Seattle. That's Maybe where, not. That's where I grew up, Seattle. So. You grew up in Seattle. Well, mm -hmm. this is Middle Eastern, the falafel is. Mm -hmm. And I think Chef's is largely influenced by the Mediterranean. Uh, but he got a little South America in there with his mm -hmm. mole sauce. That lamb is exquisite. Well, I think the mole sauce came into my life and probably in Texas. Yes, well, it's yes. I'm also it on was. tour as a dancer. Now, that's one of the great advantages to uh, be a, a working professional dancer in New York City. You get is to travel. You, you travel. <laughs> so I, I had cuisine in Europe, um, Asia, uh, South America. And now you have and it now all on it's, one it's place so here exotic. in Kansas City. This is as good as anything and I've ever had. Oh, well, that's so nice to hear. Sometimes exotic foods can be a little off-putting, and this feels very, as we say, accessible. It's delicious. All right, you're not done with your assignment. You have to sip the wine. Oh, the wine. You have to sip the wine. Mm. So, to your health. Thank you. Thank and to life. Chef was right about mm -hmm. that. He wanted some acid to hold up to this. Do you like the wine with this? Love it. Mm. Okay. Great. So time. you've got a hit on your hands. I mean, Tom Sawyer, <laughs> world premiere in the New York Times thought so too. So you had the good housekeeping stamp of approval. <laughs> how, how did it feel to launch a world premiere with well, something so Americana well, like right. Tom Sawyer? Right. Well, Tom Sawyer uh, came to me as a uh, score, first of all, by okay. the Broadway composer Maury Yeston. Okay. And Maury is the composer of such shows as Nine, which Tommy Tudor oh, yeah, directed, yeah, yes. and uh, Grand Hotel he contributed, uh, Titanic. And he also wrote uh, Phantom of the Opera, just called Phantom, that okay. plays all over the world and is, is uh, quite quite well received wherever it's, it's shown. So he sent you this score? He sent me and a score. from that came, you created the ballet? Well, the score was intended to be a ballet. Okay. And it's been something he's been working on for about 20 years. So he Lots was working, of passion, lots of devotion there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He gave looking, it to the right person. Yeah. Well, it turned out that uh, we'd known each other, okay. but um, it turned out to be a great collaborative effort. And as you said, the New York Times, came to the last two shows mm -hmm. and uh, were very complimentary. So we're, we're thrilled. Kudos to Kansas City. I mean, we've got this great performing arts center. We have amazing talent. So we have a venue to help recognize um, the great talent that we have here. What's coming up with the ballet this season? We have Nutcracker. Of course the, we the have, it's a tradition. Come. Yes, it's a tradition. Mm -hmm. our annual um, festive contribution mm -hmm. to the, the city and yes. that um, plays most of December at yes. the, the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts. And after that, Romeo and Juliet, and uh, after that, Masters of American Dance in May, it's the end of the season. You've just got something for everyone. There's a lot you going do, on. You have a lot going on. Beautiful. Well, you know, performing arts, this to me is a performing art, and I know your schedule's frenetic. I really appreciate you taking the time out Thank to come you. here and be our taster. Thank you. My okay. pleasure. All right, and now you have to finish the <laughs> Good. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks.
Hello and welcome to In the Cellar by Marquee Selections. I have with me its managing director, Chris Cribb. Thank you for inviting us into your cellar again. Sure, Bonnie. Great to be with you here. Okay. It's Thanksgiving, practically. Practically. Okay. We wanted well, to get you ready. Yeah, we do. And there are so many complex flavors associated with the holiday what to serve with them and I know you have the answers. Sure. Okay. You know, we wanted to keep things a little simple this year. So Simples always work. And we, yeah. we brought out three very nice wines for you to take a look at today. Okay. They're all different styles. The uh, price point on all of them is under $15. So you very good. easy, easy <laughs> on the budget. And um, and I think they'll really uh, complement a lot of those different flavors. Okay. Tell us what's this first one right sure. here. We've got a, is this the Riesling? This is a Riesling. So this is an awesome Australian Riesling. Okay. So Riesling is um, mostly known from coming from Germany. Yes. Um, Australia has a, a rich winemaking history for 200 years, no prohibition. So they've been making Riesling down there for a long time as well. When Australians make Riesling, they make it a little less sweet. So we call this an off-dry style. So for those people who go, oh, I, I, I don't do Riesling because it's too sweet, you really need to give this a try. Right. And it's, it, but it's got just that touch of sweetness to it mm -hmm. so that if you do like that sweet style, it has just a little bit of flavor to it. It's, it's almost like it's more bright and fruity. Okay, so, so let's give this a try sure. and then... Ooh. We'll talk about, you know, why it pairs with those, those good things for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. get a it's bit of tart. That. It it's, is tart. Yeah. Okay, this would hold up to the turkey, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh, because we usually think of a white wine for turkey, but the turkey usually has been basing in butter, and we we've, we've done it right. And what what to stand up to that rich richness? It's the acid in, the, in a wine it like is. this. Because when you think about something like um, you know, you get the everyday off off the shelf Chardonnay. Right. You put Which it with is the what turkey. we typically do. It's fine. It's it, fine. It, it can it's be fine. fine, but it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. contrast mm -hmm. with the acid. Mm -hmm so that it kind of cleans your palate. And that's one of the things that this really does with I, the turkey. I would not have thought of that, except that I'm probably going to do it now yeah. because it's not sweet. I would describe it more as citrus sharp, and you just want to take that next bite of turkey after you've sipped that wine. Absolutely, yeah. And okay. it's got you know it's got that little bit lower uh, alcohol as well. Mm. So in terms of how it feels on your mouth and the palate, um, you know when Ooh, you're talking about precious. one that's like a 13, 14 percent, it starts to get a little heavy. Where this is you know 11 and a half, 12 percent. So and we're supposed to get sleepy from the turkey anyway, so this will wake you up. <laughs> yeah. This will wake you up so a I really bit. Think, I think Riesling's a great pairing for, for your turkey day meal. Um, and you know it also kind of goes with some of those other those other flavors you get on the outside. So what else might you want to serve? What course might you want to serve this with? Well, it, it kind of depends on what your family of does course. as a tradition. My family, one of the things that we do, which is not necessarily tradition everywhere, is we do um, like an apple crisp. Um, you know, something like That's that. That's a tradition. That yeah. happens in our house, too. <laughs> you know, something so like that. So good dessert. It, it does. It's Because of the versatility of it being oh, so nice and light, it also kind of plays nicely with your dessert course. And so in our app, we just... You eat that we really big plate of food, and then afterwards, you're having that light, light thing. This, the wine okay. goes back with that. Well, and you know, so many apple crisps or apple pies do have grated orange or lemon zest in it. True. And this is, mind us, and this is a match made in heaven. All right, so what else do we have for Thanksgiving and what are we gonna pair it with? Sure, well, the, the second place, so we started with Australia, we now did. we're gonna go to the rosé. Okay. Um, you know, we just we did our little talk about rosé a few weeks back here. We and, did do that. And you know, we, what we said is that rosés are not just not just pink wine, not just white Zinfandel anymore. You know, because so many people said, well, make up your mind. Is it either red or is it white? And now they have delivered a red wine that won't blow you over with tannins, but still, I think, captures flavor. It does. It, it captures does. flavor. It's got a little bit of a, a spice to it. Um, and it's not, it's not sweet, really. Not you know, sweet. it you get that same idea no, that we got sweet. with the other one. No, we have a surprise. So it's got kind of this strawberry flavor. Oh, how yummy. I remember this now. Yeah, a little bit of that kind of watermelon, cranberry. 
cranberry always jumps out with when I think of Thanksgiving. And for this. you have to have cranberry, whether yeah. you do the preserves or whether it's from a can, whatever your tradition is, that flavor and cranberry muffins, and I just saw a cranberry cloth of tea. Cranberry muffins. That sounds like a good one. <laughs> okay. I like that. So, idea. so. We, we've got us covered on yeah. the cranberry scene. What else might this pair with at the table? You know, I think that this would also be good with the um, with the stuffing. This also is very good wine for um, for ham. You know, if many people do both. Yes. Ham and turkey. So this, you know, goes oh, nicely with that with a little more saltiness in the hand. Especially if you use Dijon mustard anywhere, this yeah, would be. absolutely. Oh my goodness, I'm getting so, very hungry for <laughs> Thanksgiving. Well, and when you think of, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this, so this is Malbec Rosé. Mal Malbec, so, okay. So this is Malbec, the uh, the grape from Argentina. Which we love. Which we, you know, we, we mm. feel like that's a, a great growing region, and um, so it gets a little bit of that darker fruit flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about like the cranberries and those type of things, those that's also pulled out in our third wine that we have, which is red wine. So, you know, if you're talking about your 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 in between for okay. some people to want right. to We've got something red. for everyone here yeah. actually. And then we've got the red where, you know, they're like all I drink is red. Or and I hear that and I respect that. Sure. Too. Well, okay. you know, red wine's got more health benefits for it. it. You if know. you can deal with the tannins, sure. it, it is. It's From preservatol, you know, being mm -hmm. a, uh, a component in it, to um, just the, the red wine. Compound. So whose red is this? So this is staccato, which is a cabernet and malbec wow. blend. So it, it takes that Malbec grape we just got a little bit familiar with on the rosé. We did. It adds Cabernet, the, the king of the deep king. red yes, grapes, yes. Mm -hmm. to it to make it a little more full-bodied. And um, I find this one, you know, goes really well with the, the hardiest things that you're going to be putting on for your Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it's, uh, if it's something that's got a big sauce on with the turkey, um, well, your know, gravies but, frequently, yeah. frequently have that. You know, we've, we've gone to the bigger glass yes. here. More yeah. air. We talked about how important that is for our rich, full-bodied reds. And don't feel bad if you're at Grandma's house and she doesn't have this big glass. It, okay. You know, regular glass will work. Actually, you know, even if you've got a big red and there's nothing around, a water glass is a is a nice. Because it will give you the space for the air. Gives yes. You the space for the air. So okay. that's that's a little hint. Okay. And, we um, hint. And then what, what, what I find mm. is that, you know, when we get into something that's got a little more fat to it, this goes well with that, um, you know. There's butter with that turkey. Yeah. I mean, and if you're a red wine person. So I know some people that do like a stuffing with oysters, you know, something like that. Very will be a rich. More complex yes. and rich and needs mm -hmm. a little bit more, um, a little more flavor. And yeah, it's, uh, it's also very versatile for some of those foods that are hard to pair, mm -hmm. you know, something that Asparagus is always just Asparagus a, is a challenge, and people frequently do Brussels sprouts with bacon. And bacon, this, yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> this is going to stand up to the bacon in the Brussels sprouts. So, okay, so, so we, we're going to serve this at cellar temperature. Sure, yeah, so let's serve this cellar temperature. You know, if I am, I'm frequently the one that you gets the call to say, hey, can you bring some wines to? Let's uh, talk about transporting because sure. that is frequently a challenge. It is. So if you have the um, that position, and it depends on how early you want to go ahead and um, to get things ready for your event. Okay. If you're going straight and you know they're going to be consumed within an hour, what I usually do is I just put them in the fridge at my okay. house beforehand. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of the, uh, the small grocery type bags that they give you that are kind of transport. Mm -hmm. friendly mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. wine bottles. Uh, if you actually ask when you're buying wine next time, they've got those inserts that go into uh, the cases. Oh. You can put an insert into one of those small bags. It acts just like a little holder to hold everything to, to be able to take it. Uh, so we reduce breakage. So you reduce breakage. Do. You don't have any problems there. Yes. And when you get there, your first job could be just put it in the freezer. Yeah. Take 10 minutes, put it in the freezer, it'll just give it that Remember chill. Remember it's there. Remember it's there. You can't, yeah, you can't leave <laughs> it there all day. Questions. But okay. that, that's a good way to, you know, to just not have to worry about it beforehand, take care of it when it gets there, and then you're ready to go. And then you're ready to go. And if you're really in charge of the wine at the event, you could help get the glasses put together because we want our rosés and our whites to have less air in the bowl. Sure. And the deep reds, we want a little more. And yep. You could be helpful with that. And they've got some. They've well. got some really nice disposable stemware as well. Mm -hmm. um, they've got some uh, picnic picnic stemware that mm -hmm. they they come out with. Mm -hmm. It is a, um, a hard acrylic plastic. 
that um, uh, I've seen uh, traveled very nicely as okay. well. So I have a question, and it does pertain to Thanksgiving because sometimes we bring out our best for Thanksgiving. Absolutely. I was once told that there is a difference in the wine experience if you drink out of crystal as opposed to glass. Have you ever heard that? I have. Okay, and the reason that I was given for this is because it is a denser material and it retains the flavors and temperature and what do you think? I believe that, um, I believe that a, the shape is the biggest thing. It's the biggest it's thing. It's the biggest thing. And so you get, mm -hmm. you get a good shape, you are going to half the battle. There you go. But the, the other half of the battle, if you do have crystal, it does, um, it almost acts as a, uh, almost an inert, um, where something doesn't stick to it. If you think about oil uh -huh. and how oil looks in an engine, yes. wine is kind of the same way in the glass. You can see the inside of the glass and how right. it sticks to it. Well, it sticks to glass and it sticks to crystal differently. And so the body and the feel of how it goes into your mouth, the way it comes off the lip of the glass makes it a different experience. Makes it a different experience. So I, I, should you have crystal, it would be a great time to bring it out just it to out. go that extra mile for these wines. Absolutely. Okay. You know, I, I was given a tip when we got married a couple years back that says, mm -hmm. you will have only so many chances to experience the finest things of wine. So mm -hmm. when you have that opportunity, go ahead. Pull out the fine china, mm -hmm. pull I'm, out the crystal. I'm told the and, same and thing about coffee to drink it out of porcelain is a different experience than a pottery. So, yeah, so okay, so we're going the extra mile should should we have crystal available to yeah. us. And um, you've gone the extra mile as well in your selection process for the marquee portfolio. It's been recognized by Wine Spectator. Tell us how you um, achieve this tremendous accomplishment. Sure. You know, we've done a, a lot of homework to find not only um, unique areas to bring wines from and unique producers, um, but a, a number of winemakers that really are my ambassadors from that nation that help us um, to create the best that we can. Uh, we, we tried uh, wines from Argentina and Australia here today for the yes, uh, for this mm -hmm. meal. And um, Keith Bryan's my winemaker in Australia. He's a former pilot that um, that started growing a vineyard in the uh, in his backyard when he would have two weeks off. There you go. You know, he was flying this a plane. This is passion, you know? yeah. And so he um, he realized that he just loved it, fell in love mm -hmm. with it. You know, gave up the flying career, and uh, we. Uh, we are lucky to We're have grateful. him <laughs> yes, to be able to just work on, on grapes. And the, the passion that those winemakers put right. into their products um, really comes out, especially with our sustainable green focus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not cheap. It's not easy nope. to be able to follow all of the rules to, uh, to make that happen. And... Um, and we're, we're really not happy to see that they're committed to it and it shows in the wine. So. It does. Well, thank you for taking the care, for finding these people passionate about what they do. Next week, we are going to be in the cellar pairing more cheese and wines because it's time to entertain. It in is. the meantime, how can we learn more about Marquis? Well, besides being able to uh, find us out on the website, yes. uh, we have... Um, www.marquee.com yes. has a uh, list of all of our locations we're sold in mm -hmm. and all of including the... restaurants and shops yes yes yeah. okay so you can go and you can take a look there uh, we have a online store called the marquee seller that mm -hmm. you can purchase at and um, you can join one of our groups so facebook youtube twitter to be able to follow all of our events and things that we're doing as well okay. well thank you for taking the time not only to select but to teach us so to your health and a happy Thanksgiving holiday. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.